Hello, my name is Sam Felton. I'm the Director of the Public Health Collaboration. Now, before I hand over to Liz, uh, who will be taking you through the Real Food Lifestyle course, uh, I just wanted to mention that in addition to providing this course for free, we also run an online weekly lifestyle support group you can join as well. Uh, simply go to our website at www.phcuk.org forward slash support and you can sign up right there. Also on the website, you can find lots of free resources and projects that you can get involved in, such as Real Food Runners or even the Ambassadors Programme as well. Uh, and if you find any of our content valuable whatsoever, uh, please, please, please do consider donating what you can or even regularly contributing to the charity by becoming an annual member. Now, without further ado, let me hand you over to Liz. Hello and welcome back to session six of our Real Food Life Car Low Carb Lifestyle course. Just a reminder that the information contained in this course is just that. It's information and not medical advice. And if you have any medical questions, then you need to speak with your doctor or your nurse. So today we're going to talk about low carbon dementia, ADHD, migraines, arthritis and other inflammatory conditions. But before we start the session, I thought I'd share this little video made you made by another PHC ambassador who works in Liverpool. Let's have a listen. My name's Andy Bishop um, and I've been running a low carb and real food lifestyle course for the last eight weeks. I work as um, the, one of the Liverpool ambassadors for public health collaboration. Um, they're a charity who promote this real food lifestyle. And part of my role as an ambassador is to work and develop networks with GPs, nurses and so on to promote this way of living. So reducing your sugar, reducing processed carbohydrates and the impact that's going to have on your overall health, weight and well-being. I was diagnosed as a type 2 diabetic. And I pretty soon found some sources that said, well, if you start reducing the amount of processed carbohydrate you eat and you move a bit more, it could help with this diabetes thing. And that's exactly what I did. So in three months, my bloods went from 62 down to 39. Now, 39 is classed in the normal range. And I'm not saying that it's cured my type 2 diabetes, but it certainly enabled me to keep my diabetes in remission for the last three years. It was about 20 to 25 um, each week. It's a one hour session. Uh, the, the current version of this runs for eight weeks. And it's introducing people into the idea of what low carbon real food is all about and um, showing them how this food can be really tasty and not boring or bland and um, trying to make it as easy as possible to understand some of the science behind it and also getting people to realize how important those numbers are that the doctors and nurses quote to you when you get your blood test done. So I joined to try to reverse my diabetes. I've gone a long way to doing that. Hopefully I'll still achieve that goal, I've lost weight, feel better, and I've been introduced to foods I didn't know exist. Uh, it's been excellent. Uh, I've lost uh, one stone and two pounds. Uh, I actually lost that in the first three weeks. HbA1c has gone from 94 to 71. And medication-wise, I was taking 32 units of insulin. That's now down to 14. Again, probably over a period of about maybe four weeks, maybe eight weeks, I spoke to my doctor, several doctors, and the diabetic nurse, and they all recommended I, I drop the dosage insulin down to that amount. So far, so good. Hopefully, we can get it down even further. I've been coming to this group for support for my husband. 
who is a type 2 diabetic. This group has taught me a, a, a whole load of stuff. It's been amazing. The support from the group has been fab. And I'm still working on my husband. I've actually lost weight since I've been on it. And the thing is, it's just about looking after your own health, keeping yourself well and making them small changes to make a big difference. The community aspect of this, bringing everyone together, enables people to share common experience. So if we're building um, relationships with people who, who, who've never met each other. They're, they're becoming more confident about their cooking and experiences. They're talking more openly about this. Not only do we run the one-hour sessions, we also have a, a, a closed WhatsApp group and a Facebook group. So there's a lot of chatter between people there. And we can see people are you know, making new friendships and becoming more confident. And so there's a lot of other benefits than just the medical side of it. Rendro too, and I've been part of the low carb. It's five years since my husband died. And he loved his food, but he had proper meals. Since he died, I'm rubbish. Out of packets, aspirins, fries, wedges, you name it. And I felt wrong, horrible. It's not been this. Wow. I've lost nearly a stone. And move things up. Just feel younger inside. And it's made it easier. Because when the husband died, it was so hard. And it's not just the grief, it's the not bothering. But I'm bothering a bit. It's great. I'm just so happy with myself. I suggest that people give low carb a go, especially if you're a type 2 diabetic, because unfortunately, it's still classed as a chronic progressive disease that is only going to get worse and takes its time. Your, your medication is more likely to go up, and by adopting a low carb lifestyle, you've got a chance of reducing your meds, if not coming off the medication altogether. So it'll help you look better, feel better, live longer. So I think you can see what benefits all those people have gained from doing this. And I hope you're beginning to see changes in your health as you go through our course. So as I say, we've concentrated largely on diabetes through the course so far. And last week we touched on heart disease. But I want to talk a bit about other conditions for which lifestyle changes can be important. And the first of these is dementia, and in particular Alzheimer's, which affects the largest proportion of dementia patients. If you live to the age of 85, you have a 50% chance of developing dementia. And in the UK, it's the primary cause of death in the elderly. What is more, the prevalence is increasing, partly because we have an aging population, but also because of environmental changes such as diet, but also air pollution and additives. Women are more likely to develop it than men, although the reasons aren't entirely clear as yet. But women do process lipids differently from men and have different hormonal responses. So there are lots of things involved. Type 2 diabetes increases your risk of developing Alzheimer's too, largely because the excess glucose that leads to insulin resistance affects the brain in the same way as it affects other organs of the body, and also because it causes inflammation. You may have heard dementia referred to as type 3 diabetes, and this is because the conditions are linked. The following comes from an online seminar on the prevention of Alzheimer's. I've included the full transcript of this episode in our resources folder, so you can take a fuller look at it later if you want to. According to Dr. Sarah Gottfried, who's a US diabetes specialist and based on the latest cutting edge research, up to 60% of cognitive decline, which is poor memory, etc., is due to the way our body handles glucose and the insulin response. If you process carbs efficiently, like, for example, the actress Jennifer Aniston, who's always been super thin and never struggled with weight, your body processes carbs well. 
But for many of us, this isn't the case. And the excess carbs get stored in the cells and cause inflammation at the cellular level. This isn't the same sort of inflammation that you get with, say, a sore throat or around a wound. It's invisible inflammation, which damages the cells. And the inability to deal effectively with the glucose is called insulin resistance, which we've, me we've mentioned previously. And this affects the blood-brain barrier. And when this becomes damaged, the insulin receptors become damaged and glucose can't get through to the brain effectively. So if you have other more visible signs of insulin resistance, like type 2 diabetes or obesity, the chances are the damage is almost certainly occurring in the brain as well. And here on this scan, you can see a normal healthy brain on the left. Um, and here you can see it looks very different. And this is somebody with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease, so not even particularly advanced. But you can already see distinct changes in the brain. As Dr. Mark Hyman puts it, we know that if you have pre-diabetes, you get pre-dementia or what we call mild cognitive impairment or MCI. We know that the mechanism in the brain that's driving some of the inflammation has to do with what we call insulin resistance, which is driven from eating too much sugar and starch. We know that sugar is highly inflammatory and that Alzheimer's is an inflammatory disease. So we have all these linkages that we put together that make it very clear that a diet high in starch and sugar is bad for you. And the bigger your belly, the smaller your brain is actually what the science shows. Inflammation both contributes to and is a result of insulin resistance in the body. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario. But by eating the right foods, by focusing on low carb, fibrous veggies, nutrient dense whole foods, and of course, avoiding the inflammatory vegetable oils, you're going to go a long way towards mitigating inflammation in the body and thus helping your body better process glucose, which is going to promote insulin sensitivity, which is then going to help minimize your risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Stabilizing blood sugars is vital if we want to keep our brains healthy. The hippocampus is especially vulnerable to big spikes and peaks in blood sugar, and it's really sensitive to the same types of forces that cause diabetes, i.e. high blood sugar and high insulin levels. The reason for that is that the hippocampus needs more insulin most, than most of the rest of the brain does. This is a bit counterintuitive and doesn't really sound true, but it is. The more sugar you eat and the higher your insulin levels, the less insulin gets into the brain and it starves the hippocampus of energy with the result that the hippocampus shrinks. And as this is the main center for memory, memory starts to go. And as you can see here, this is in an Alzheimer's brain here. The hippocampus is this part, uh, sorry, down here. And as you can see in the normal brain, it's quite fat and, and, and sort of sumptuous, whereas here it's all small and wizened. This shrinkage can also be seen on brain scans. In addition to a good diet, exercise is also helpful. Dr. Sarah Gottfried again says, the idea here is that there's an equation. The food that you eat can raise your blood sugar. Stress can raise your blood sugar too. And we know that exercise can help you manage your blood sugar and stress. So what exercise does is it makes your muscles hungry for glucose. So I actually think that if we get back to the definition of health and wellness, it's absolutely essential that you exercise regularly, that you've got a lot of physical movement, so that you're making your muscles hungry for glucose. And as we've said, we covered, talked about exercise last week. Um, just as important as going for those brisk walks is doing things that were included in Dr. Chatterjee's kitchen workout, those resistance exercises, those push-ups, albeit against a kitchen door, and lifting cans and doing lunges, if you remember all of those. The benefits of exercise include reducing stress, improving insulin sensitivity, they increase neurogenesis and increase neuroplasticity. Come on to that. We talked about exercise in an earlier session and the benefits are varied and significant. It's been shown that walking regularly, briskly over a period of just one year noticeably increases the size of the hippocampus, which, as we heard, is the area of the brain that controls memory. It also helps improve insulin sensitivity. That's the way your body and brain uh, responds to the insulin produced in your body. 
Neurogenesis means the growth of new neurons. At one time, it was thought that we had a finite number of brain cells at birth. And as we age, these died off and were not replaced. We now know this is not the case, but that we can go on growing brain cells throughout our life and that the connections between them can also change. This is what's called neuroplasticity. But to do this, they need a good diet, good gut health, exercise and good sleep. There's also an issue, an issue with environmental toxins. We can't avoid all of these, of course. But for example, eating organic means you avoid pesticides and other chemicals used in growing non-organic produce. You can also think of using organic household products rather than those containing toxic chemicals. This will help the environment too, of course. And we may not all be able to do everything, but every little change we make has an effect on our brain. So simple steps to remove to improve your brain health, dramatically reduce your intake of simple sugar and refined carbohydrates, optimize your microbiome, which we haven't talked about a lot. But one of the biggest things you can do for your microbiome is to eat fermented foods that can be things like kefir, which is a little bit like yogurt. And also things like sauerkraut. You can buy sauerkraut or you can make your own. It's very simple and obviously a lot cheaper to make your own. You can consume a lower carbohydrate diet that's focused on ample amounts of nutrient rich foods and fibrous vegetables, which again feed the microbiome. You exercise regularly. Think about fasting, even if it's not prolonged fasting, but some level of fasting and getting good quality sleep. Making these changes can not only put your type 2 diabetes in remission, but also significantly reduce your risk of developing Alzheimer's. And let's face it, none of us would want to end our days in a state of dementia. This is Eleanor Gross, a young neuroscientist who suffered with migraines throughout her teenage years until she heard about a keto or very low carbohydrate diet and discovered the effect that ketones produced when your body burns fats instead of carbs have on migraine. She now studies the effect of keto on migraine. And since sharing her story on Diet Doctor, they've received dozens of reports from other people who've similarly gone from a life of almost constant pain and fear to almost no symptoms at all. We've given you the link to this piece in the resources folder so you can look it up. Um, look up all this extra information if there if you, you want to. So again, if you know someone who suffers with migraine, you might like to suggest that they take a look at the information and diet doctor and elsewhere, of course, and maybe join our course. Low carbon ADHD. I'm sure we're all familiar with how kids behave when fueled by fizzy drinks and birthday cake at a party. But for some children, that sort of behavior is an everyday pattern. If any of you watch The Magic Pill, you can find it on YouTube. And again, the link is in our resources. You will have seen the dramatic results obtained by two families who struggled with children with severe symptoms once they adopted a low carb or keto diet. Again, on Diet Doctor, you can find inspiring stories from other families who found enormous benefits by changing their diet. We've given you the link to these in the resources folder, so check those out on the website. And again, if you know anyone who's struggling with their child's behavior, then you might suggest they take a look at that. And if they're interested, they could follow our course. Low carb is certainly not just for the middle aged. That said, a study at the University of Alabama in Birmingham in the USA examined the effects of low carb diets on people between the ages of 65 and 75, all of whom had severe arthritis of the knee. This was a randomized control trial, which is the highest level of um, research that you can do with some patients on a low fat diet, others on a low carb diet and others continuing with their normal standard diet. There was a significant improvement in those on a low carb diet, which reduced the levels of oxidative stress, which causes inflammation. And as we've discussed before, carbs and seed oils are both inflammatory. As the strong painkillers usually prescribed for the condition can have nasty side effects, a low carb diet may prove to be a much better way of reducing pain and inflammation. Dr. Gary Fetke is an Australian orthopedic surgeon, and he finds that when he recommends a low carb diet to his patients awaiting knee surgery, many of them end up not needing the surgery at all. And indeed, 
I've had cases in my local low carb group of patients coming maybe to reverse their diabetes, but ending up also resolving their problems of arthritis. So another reason for adopting a low carb lifestyle. PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome is strongly related to insulin resistance and type two diabetes. For many cancers, too, the combination of traditional treatments like chemo and radiotherapy have much better outcomes when combined with a keto or very low carbohydrate diet. Breast cancers respond well, and case studies and patient data analyses have found improvements in various types of brain cancer, including something known as GBM, which is geoblastoma, which is the most common and aggressive form of brain cancer. In fact, it is in improvement with keto diets. This is perhaps is not surprising. Um, the biggest improvement is with brain cancer, uh, which is perhaps not surprising when we remember about the links between insulin resistance and the brain. No one is suggesting you shouldn't have the traditional treatments of chemo and radiotherapy. But there is evidence that those who also follow a low carb stroke keto diet can require less aggressive treatments and have better long term outcomes. Recent studies seem to indicate that low carb can be very useful in helping to manage symptoms of Parkinson's disease too, but research in that on that is in the very early stages. With traumatic brain injury, on the other hand, there's often interference in the brain's ability to use glucose, and research has shown here that a low carbohydrate diet can be effective because the receptors that are damaged on the surface of the brain um, can use ketones where they can't use glucose. So it can be helpful in recovering from serious brain injury um, as the ketones, as I say, get into the brain more easily than the glucose. There's already been quite a bit of research in this area with very promising results. Also recently, a lot of results with other neurological conditions um, such as bipolar disease and schizophrenia. Our skin can also be affected significantly by diet and all these conditions such as psoriasis, acne, eczema, etc., cetera, um, can be improved by adopting a low carbohydrate diet and of course, cutting out the inflammatory vegetable oils. So as you can see, there's a very wide range of conditions for which a low carb diet would either seem to offer much more, much better prospects than conventional medicine or which greatly increase the efficacy of traditional means of treatment. There's much more information available on the internet if you're interested in any particular condition. And remember, you can always join our support group, which will give you access to trained coaches and the PHC network of health professionals who can provide further information about a particular issue. Just check out our website for details of how to join. So to recap, we've looked at the influence of low carb on brain health and also low carb for ADHD and indeed for other health issues as well. In our next episode, we're going to talk about eating out and the pitfalls in doing that. And also answering the question, why am I not losing weight? So I look forward to seeing you next time and goodbye and thank you for now.